be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Hello, friends. My name is Omid Safi, and you are listening to the Sufi Heart Podcast. As we come upon this season of the year, where many of our friends are getting ready to celebrate Christmas. Um, in the Western Christian tradition, um, it is the familiar December 25th. For some of our Orthodox Christian friends, it might be um, after the New Year. And uh, it is common for people to uh, indeed try to tap into that season of aspiring towards peace on earth and goodwill towards all. And in that spirit, I wanted to offer you uh, a sense of how it is that the heart of the Islamic tradition has looked at the significance of Christmas, of the birth of Jesus, and the sacred experience of Maryam, Hazrat Maryam, or Mary. So we are going to be taking a close look at the Quran as well as the mystical tradition that has emerged from the Quranic tradition through sages like Rumi. You know, it's, uh, it's common for those of us who are Muslim and those of us who are Christian and those of us who are Jewish to say things like, we all believe in the same God and um, we might share some uh, foundational ethical teachings that guide our lives and surely there's a truth to that as well. But I think rather than simply settling for the lowest common denominator, what I'm going to encourage us to do in this conversation is to aspire to the highest common denominator, the deepest. And indeed, we might find that our different faith traditions are a little bit like climbing a mountain, that the higher we climb, the more broad and vast our outlook can become. So in that spirit, we want to uh, dive into the birth of Jesus as told and understood by our Muslim friends. So to begin with, I think it's important to realize that um, Hazrat Maryam, or Mary, is um, without a doubt the most prominent female personality in the Quran. Uh, in fact, of the 114 chapters of the Quran, the 19th chapter is named Surah Maryam, the chapter of Mary. And um, we're going to see that in the context of this chapter and other passages in the Quran, uh, the experience of Mary receiving Jesus uh, is described, indeed, as we see in the Gospels, as an um, immaculate conception. The virgin birth is very much attested to in the context of the Quran. 
um, that Jesus is recognized as, of course, a prophet, one of the great prophets of God, um, indeed the greatest, along with uh, Ibrahim, Abraham, and Musa, Moses, uh, Isa, Jesus, and the last of the prophet, um, Sayyidina Muhammad. And um, Jesus is also called uh, the Masih, the Messiah, and of course the Greek translation of that is Christ. Um, and indeed, there are important honorifics in the Quran, such as Jesus being described as a kalima, a word from God, uh, as a performer of extraordinary miracles. But maybe the best way to do this is um, to actually have us go through and carefully and slowly together uh, work our way through some of the Quranic passages. So we will begin with um, Surah Maryam, the chapter of Mary, around um, the 16th line. The previous passages describe the birth of John and her mother's experience, which in many ways resembles and parallels uh, the birth of Jesus through Mary. Um, I realize that some of you may not have had a chance to ever have heard the Quran being recited. It may sound a little bit like chanting. Um, so it may not be a terrible idea just to listen to a few seconds of how uh, the verses that we're going to be listening to sound in the original Arabic. And it would sound like something like this. Okay. So the 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 landscape where uh, the Quran places the birth of Jesus uh, is both familiar and also a little different. So uh, if our understanding of Christmas has become um, commodified and commercialized, where sometimes it seems like it's more about Santa Claus uh, and the three wise men bringing presents, um, well, you know, the Quran uh, it doesn't have much to do with that. It's not so much about the baby in the manger. It is the story as it starts on the 16th line of this verse. Remember in the book, in that um, great scripture, uh, the story of Maryam, of Mary, when she withdraws from her people, from her family, to a place in the east. So um, the common way that this story is told is that Mary goes into the desert, into somewhere to the east of her family home, uh, as um, was her habit for times of prayer and reflection and meditation. Um, and she goes into a kind of khalwa, a kind of retreat, a spiritual retreat, which certainly was practiced at the time of Jesus. And it's also one of the characteristic features of Muslim devotional life. Um, so she places uh, a, a screen um, to between herself and, and others. She distances herself from others to go into this retreat. And then the divine voice comes in that majestic we voice. We sent our spirit to appear before her uh, in form of, uh, of a human creature, of a um, perfected man, sometimes it is translated. Farsalna um, eleha ruhana, right? We sent to Mary our spirit, fatamathala, and this spirit 
um, takes on the shape, the form of a human. Right? It's also the word for an allegory. Uh, sometimes the one that you meet might um, look like the human, but the human form is actually the allegory and the real meaning is that it could be a spirit from God. It could be an angel. And, and indeed, there are uh, spiritual traditions that talk about keeping the possibility open that everyone that you meet could be an angel. Everyone that you meet could represent someone from the spiritual realm, the subtle realm. And um, in some Sufi traditions, the Naqshbandi traditions, there's a notion that everyone that you meet could be that mysterious prophet, Khazar. So uh, treat them well, because you never know. But in this case, there's already a foreshadowing, um, because it is uh, the spirit of God, Ruhana, that is being sent to Mary. Uh, and Mary is expecting to have solitude and privacy. Uh, she said, uh, I seek shelter in the all-compassionate one. I seek shelter in God from you. Um, if you have any fear, if you're in awe of God, if you're a God-fearing man, um, keep your distance. And at this point, the, the angel uh, reveals her true, uh, his true identity. Uh, I am, I am just a messenger from your Lord. I've come to announce to you uh, the news of a ghulam and zakiyan, of a, a pure son, of a holy son. Mary responds by saying, how can I have a son when no human has touched me, right? I have, I have been uh, in a virginal state. I've not been unchaste. And the angel is made to respond, قَالَ كَذَلِكَ um, Be it as it may, قَالَ رَبُّكَ هُوَ عَلَيَّ حَيَّن um, The Lord has said, this is easy for me. And we're going to make him, this pure son, who is, of course, Jesus, ayatan linnas. We're going to make him an ayah. So what is an ayah? An ayah is a sign of God. It's a sight of divine manifestation. It's the same word that's used for each verse of the Quran. An ayah is someone or something that when you see, you look through them and you see what's beyond. They become a threshold. They become a portal to a more subtle realm. Um, this was, of course, the original meaning of icon, right? In this sense, Jesus was an icon. You don't just see the icon, you're seen by the icon, and you see through the icon. So there's already the sense that when you see someone um, of the luminosity of Jesus or of any of the great prophets, don't just stay stuck by looking at them. See them and see beyond them and see through them and see the one who is animating them. Um, we're going to make him an ayah for humanity minna, and a mercy from us which now this part that Jesus has been sent as a mercy from God of course is already pointing to a parallel that we're going to get with the being of the Holy Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad, who is sent as Rahmatun lil alameen, a mercy from God sent not just to this world, but to all the infinite universes. Um, coming back to this verse, 
we're going to send Jesus as a sign of God to humanity, as a mercy from us, from God. And this is a matter that has been decreed. This is a matter that um, is a blessing from, from God. Um, now, if we can step away for one second from the Quranic account, of course, the work of Muslim sages and mystics is to often uh, elaborate on these Quranic verses and sometimes to um, dramatize them, to seek the light that um, has been shining through them and to sit with it. So Molana Rumi, the beloved Rumi, has an extraordinary account in his third book of the Masnavi, his masterpiece, where um, he goes on for about 20 lines or so, imagining what this encounter between Mary and um, the Holy Spirit was like. So he talks about how Mary was in her chamber and uh, he saw uh, an extraordinary, beautiful, heart-ravishing form of this spirit. And um, he was as beautiful as the moon and the sun. Uh, and when Mary sees this form, um, she starts to tremble, right? It could be from fear, it could be from attraction, um, and she wanted to make sure that she was still chaste. And um, Mary says, in Rumi's understanding, when he sees this beautiful form of the Holy Spirit, um, I'm going to seek shelter in God. I will leap into the protection of God. And Rumi goes on to say, uh, well, this is because um, for, for Mary, the whole world was a place that she was willing to abandon and to seek um, shelter in nothing and no one other than God. Right? Um, and he goes on elaborating on, on this for a while. And, um, and then here's the beautiful part. is The angel responds back to Mary. Um, so in the beginning, he starts by telling the story from Mary's point of view, and then he switches uh, the perspective, and now he tells the story from the Holy Spirit's point of view. And um, it's, it's a rather humorous account in which the Holy Spirit says, um, well, you're, you're fleeing from me to go to God, but you're fleeing from the one that the same God has sent to the one who sent me. You're fleeing from God to God. Um, he says, I am the trusted one of the divine presence. Do not fear me. Um, and... Uh, so, you know, it's the sense that the divine is both uh, the sender of the all and the comforter. And this is the experience of, of, of Mary. Um, and um, you take refuge, but I myself am that refuge. I am the one that you're seeking shelter from. It's that unitive experience. It's that getting beyond this notion of cause and effect. And it's a beautiful account of Mary's explanation, of Rumi's explanation of this particular verse. So let's go back to um, the chapter of Mary in the Quran. So she conceives of Jesus, um, and she retires with him to a remote place. Um, interestingly enough, the, um, in the 22nd verse of the Quran, 
the the word that is used um um the word that's used for that remote place that distant place um, it comes from the same root as the site of Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, Qasiyan, in the case of Mary, Aqsa, in the case of the Prophet Muhammad's night journey and heavenly ascension. So there's already a linkage that's being established between the experience of Mary and the experience of the Prophet Muhammad. And I think this might be a good point to just pause and step back from our story just a little bit. Sometimes the temptation exists to say that, um, well, you know, in Islam uh, there is a Quran and in Christianity there is a Bible. In Islam, there is um, the Prophet Muhammad as the culmination of prophecy. And in the Christian tradition, um, there is the person of Jesus. And so, you know, Quran, Bible, the Prophet, Jesus. But I think those kinds of analogies miss the point of the role that these um, luminous beings play in these traditions. So um, some sages and scholars have talked about this. Maybe a more useful point would be to ask the question of how is it that a word from God, a kalima from God, comes into this world? Well, in the Christian tradition, uh, the word is ultimately not the Bible, but it's actually the very being and person of Jesus, right? And in the Gospel of John, perhaps the most Hellenic of the canonical Gospels, we get the account, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Uh, so this is the Logos in that Christian contemplative tradition, the kalima. And um, this kalima is also something that is going to be um, associated with the being of Jesus, as we shall see. So in a Christian tradition, it's the being of Christ in his meta-historical reality, in his trans-historical reality, that is the Word of God. And the Word of God is going to be trusted and entrusted and kept in a place of sanctity in the womb of Mary. So however we come to understand that word virginal, and there's a lot of good recent scholarship to suggest that in the Hebrew tradition, the word virgin oftentimes meant a young woman, right? Perhaps, God knows best. Um, but there is a notion in which Mary has to be chaste. She has to have a measure of modesty and chastity to receive the word of God in her womb. In a Muslim tradition, it is, of course, uh, the Quran, that is, the kalima, the word of God. And likewise, the Quran has to be um, trusted and entrusted and vouchsafed to the Prophet Muhammad. But in this case, where is the Quran revealed? Uh, well, not to his womb and not to his mind, as some modern um, folks might say, but in that most quintessentially Muslim way. How do you experience God in the heart? The heart that is not just 
an organ pumping blood, but that faculty, the qalb, which is capable of perceiving the divine. So it's for that reason that the heart of Muhammad has to be, if you would, virginal. It has to be a pure heart. That's the reason that Muhammad is sometimes described as being ummi. Um, the common translation of it is that he has to be unlettered that the insight and the knowledge that he has didn't come from going to a university, it didn't come from sitting down with books and deducing that there must be a God. It is a heart that is um, as pure as when snowfall has covered everything, as pure as an open vista. So to that extent, there's yet another analogy and relationship and parallel between the function of Maryam and of Muhammad. Each of them chosen by God, purified by God, to receive the Logos, the Kalama, the Word of God, in one case, being um, the Quran, and in the other being Jesus. Well, that's a much more interesting way of experiencing these um, intertwined and yet distinct spiritual traditions of Islam and Christianity. The Prophet Muhammad and uh, Lady Mary on one hand, and the Quran and Jesus on the other. We're going to come back to um, an interesting passage at one point when um, in the... We might as well actually just do it now. <laughs> um, so in the third chapter of the Quran... A very similar story is repeated uh, for the annunciation of the birth of Jesus to Mary. In this case, um, we're told that the angels come to Mary and, and they say, In alamin. O Mary. God has chosen you and purified you. Indeed, God has chosen you over and above women of all the universes, all the worlds. If you go and you take a quick and deep look at the words that are used in that chapter, in the third chapter, verse 42, Ya Maryam, O oh Maryam, Inna Allah has tafaki. God has chosen you, purified you. That word, stafaki, is from that same root as perhaps the most common honorific of the Prophet Muhammad. Of course, that is the name Mustafa. So Mustafa, the purified and chosen one, right? you could just translate that as the chosen one, and Mary as the one whom God chooses, another parallel that is set up. Uh, and indeed, in some aspects of Islamic spirituality, in the poetry of Attar, um, the Prophet Muhammad ends up being described as the Nabi al-Ummi, the maternal prophet, um, in a way that his love and care for humanity and for creation um, is, has a maternal quality to it. And Maryam is, of course, the most significant maternal figure 
in the Quran. Um, we sometimes have a tendency to tell the history of the great religious tradition through the lenses of these men, these great men, luminous, beautiful, and um, sacred men. There is such a thing as a sacred masculinity. But there's also a sacred femininity. And what is so lovely about the way that the stories of the birth of the prophets is told is that there's also a tradition of imagining the birth of the male prophets through the lens of the women and the mothers who bore them, who carried them, who nurtured them. There's a reminder that ultimately the womb of these mothers of the prophets is an extraordinary experience of the love and mercy of God. And of course, um, the prophet Muhammad and sages like Ibn Arabi and Rumi and others always love to come back to this fact that the womb, the rahim, is deeply connected to those divine qualities of Rahman and Rahim, the all-compassionate and the all-merciful. So let's come back. Let's come back to Surah Maryam, the chapter of Mary. She carries Jesus, and at the time of birth, when she approaches that time, uh, she withdraws to a distant place, Makan and Qasiyan. Uh, we already heard about the analogy to Aqsa, that entire uh, area of um, uh, that holy site for, for Muslims. And then the pains of childbirth come. And this is one of the most tender descriptions of, of suffering as part of the experience of bringing that divine spirit into this world. Um, one might imagine that um, in some accounts, the prophets simply appear um, poofed out of the unseen realm. But that's not how the Quran approaches it. Uh, there's something about the body. The body is sacred. The spirit is literally embodied. The body is spiritualized and the spirit is corporealized. As um, my uh, dear friend and teacher, Pirzia Anayat Khan, always says, uh, your body is not a suitcase. The body is not a thing. Uh, the body is the physical manifestation of the spirit. And it's this way for Hazrat Maryam. So how is this described? The pain of childbirth drove her to cling to the trunk of a palm tree. And the pain is so great that at one point she says, I wish that I had been dead or forgotten long before all of this. Right? But then a voice whispers to her, right? It's coming from under her feet. It's coming from beneath her. Sometimes you hear the voice of God coming from above. Sometimes you hear it coming from below. Um, do not worry. Like, la tahsani. Don't sorrow. Uh, your Lord has provided a stream at your feet. And um, shake the trunk of the palm tree and you will see fresh uh, dates, ripe dates falling for you. So eat and drink and say to anyone that you might see, I vowed to the Lord of mercy to abstain from conversation and I will not talk to anyone. 
So let's go back and see what's going on here. So the first account that we get is that experience of pain and suffering from Mary. And indeed, one of our very dear friends, um, Simi Ghazi, has written a beautiful essay uh, about the way in which Muslim women in many parts of the world remember Mary, remember Maryam, and are with her at a moment of childbirth. When the birth pangs hit, they identify with the experience of Maryam. There might be even sacred plants and herbs that women clutch on to, uh, as Mary is told to clutch on to the date palm, the palm tree. Um, this becomes a, an occasion for, in a moment of solitude, a time for solidarity, to find that There is the khalvat dar anjuman. There is the seeking of solitude when you're in the middle of the crowd, of being alone with the one. When you're with the many, and there's also the complementary part here of when you're seemingly all alone to remember that the one is with you, that God is with you, and so are the entire company of the prophets and the saints. So the most popular tradition of recounting the birth experience of the chosen one, the blessed prophet Muhammad, um, is perhaps one written by a Turkish author, uh, Suleiman Celebi's Mevlut, or Maulid in Arabic, Milad in Persian. And it's the, it's the nativity scene. It's the birth experience of Hazrat Amina, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, holy mother, blessed mother. And... In her moment of giving birth, she is visited by Mary, by Asiya, the woman who raises Moses, um, by all of the sacred women who have birthed and raised the prophets into this world. So a time of solitude can become a time of community, and a time of solidarity. Hazrat Maryam in the Quran is given the assurance, sorrow not, uh, grab on to the date palm. There's that deep connection to the world of nature, of trees that are rooted deep in the ground as we must learn to become rooted and as they reach heavenward as we must reach heavenward. Uh, there is that element of water that is flowing by her feet, and it reminds us of the stories of Hagar and the baby Ishmael in the desert. And eat and drink from um, these dates and from the fountain, and say, um, inni Nadartu li Rahman, I have vowed to the Rahman, the all compassionate one. There's a beautiful account in some Sufi sources that say when Mary is fasting here, she's not fasting just from words, she's fasting from anything that is other than God. Right? So this is the interpretation that we get from Ain al Ghazata Hamidani, the 12th century mystic, that Mary's fast is, I will fast from seeing any form unless I can see the face of God in it. I will fast from everything except from God. Now that's the highest 
fast. And the breakfast, the breakfast of that fast is to behold the divine beloved. Right? Do you see how um, easily and mercifully for these sages the spiritual life and the mystical life emerges out of the experience of, of these amazing luminous beings. And then comes um, Mary out to the community and she presents um, baby Jesus. And people say in astonishment, uh, Mary, we, we thought you were a chaste one. We thought you came from a long line of chaste people. And, and she doesn't um, defend herself. She doesn't say, no, 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 those are just, that's false news. Um, she simply points to the baby, right? You point to the icon, you point to the sign of God. And people say, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to talk to this baby? And in the Quranic account, Jesus now speaks as a newborn, the first of his miraculous account, Inni Abdullah, I am the servant of God. I am the devotee of God. Um, and God has made me blessed wherever I may be, and he's commanded me to pray and to give the alms as long as I live, um, to cherish my mother. Uh, so peace be upon me the day that I am born and the day that I die and the day that I'm resurrected. It's, uh, it's telling that in that particular narrative, the very first thing that Jesus does is to identify himself as what would be the most extraordinary honor for any human being. Any Abdullah, I am the servant of God. Now, let's go back for a second, if we can, into um, the story of Mary giving birth. Well, you can imagine that someone like a Rumi uh, is going to go deep into that experience. And um, for Rumi, there is an account in which he focuses in on the pain of Maryam. And he says, until there is an aching within us, a passion and a yearning that arises within us, we will never strive to attain it. Without being willing to endure pain and suffering on the path, it will always remain beyond our reach. Whether it is success in this world, or salvation in the next world. It was the pain of the birth in Mary that made her reach for the tree. And the tree that was withered became fruitful. And then Rumi always remembers that everything that we read in the Quran is also taking place inside of us. There's something of Mary inside of you, and there's something of Jesus is inside of you, and the angel that comes to visit Mary is inside of you, and the date palm is inside of you, and the place in the east is inside of you, and the water that is gushing from beneath your feet is also inside of you. So Rumi goes on to say, we are like the story of Mary in the Quran. Every one of us has a Jesus inside. But until the birth pang manifests, our Jesus is not born. If the pain never comes, then the child of our spirit will return to its origin by the same secret path through which it came. And we will be left empty without the birth of our true self. So unlike some spiritual traditions, which are very common nowadays, where you're promised the cheap kind of happiness, 
you know, follow me and you will have wealth and prosperity and happiness and everything in life will be hunky-dory. Rumi knows better and the Quran knows better. Um, and the prophet says that we do not promise you perpetual ease and perpetual happiness, but we promise you that the same one who is sending you the pain and the challenge is the same one that you will find shelter in. I think that's an important lesson in this tradition, and it's good to sit with that. There's a couple of other points that I wanted to raise about um, the story of Mary in the world of Islamic spirituality, and then we will um, call it an episode. <laughs> um, when Mary is first brought up in the Quran, she has gone into the temple and she's sitting in a prayer niche, and um, Zechariah, comes to visit her and to bring her some food in her time of retreat. And every time that he comes to bring her food, she's already there with heavenly sustenance. There's food from God's own presence that's there. Um, that passage and the mention of this heavenly sustenance that one finds in that moment of retreat mentions the word for a prayer niche. And in many mosques around the world, uh, almost every single Turkish mosque, also many mosques in Egypt and elsewhere, it's the verse about Mary that is inscribed on um, the prayer niche. So imagine this. Imagine that... Um, Muslims go to line up for prayer, and what are they looking at? They're looking at an inscription recalling the experience of Mary. Every time that Zachariah came to Mary's chamber, or the niche in the wall, the groove in the wall, um, he found her with rezq, with sustenance directly from God. And he says, where, where did you get this from? And she says, uh, min This is indeed from God. Man yasha hisab. God gives sustenance to anyone that God wishes without measure. So there is something of the experience of Mary, that direct relationship with God, that is incorporated into the prayer life of Muslims. You might notice that up until now, I have been speaking of male prophets and the luminous saintly women who've given birth to them. Hazrat Amina given birth to the chosen one, Hazrat Muhammad. Asiya raising Moses. Hagar being with Ishmael in the desert. So is Mary a prophet? Or is she, as it were, merely the mother of a prophet, and the mother of a Christ. Well, most Muslim commentators said, no, um, you have to be male to be a prophet. That was the modern, that was a common pre-modern mainstream opinion, the majoritarian opinion. But it was never unanimous. There was a school of Islamic thought called the Zahiri school, which specifically said, no, actually, uh, being a prophet has nothing to do with being male or female. 
and Mary, Mariam, was a prophet. Well, you know, we're um, not interested in saying that one group is always right and one group is always wrong, but I do want to call your attention to something in the way that the third chapter of the Quran, the Al Imran, tells the story of Maryam. So this is the same one that starts with um, the verse that we already discussed, that God has chosen and purified Mary above women of all the worlds, the one that parallels um, the, the name, the chosen one, the honorific for the prophet Muhammad. And in this one, the angel come to Mary and they say, Ya Maryamu, إن الله يبشرك بكلمة منه اسمه المسيح إيسا بن مريم. O Mary, God gives you the good news, the gospel, the evangel, the glad tidings of a kalima, of a word from him. His name will be Masih, Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary. Um, he will be held in honor in this world and in the hereafter, and he will always be among the ones closest to God. Uh, he will speak to people in their um, cradle, in childhood, and in maturity, and he will be one of the righteous ones. So here's what I want you to pay attention. The angels come with the Annunciation. They declare to Mary, oh, Mary, good news. <laughs> um, you're going to carry the word of God. You're going to carry Jesus. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. Mary doesn't talk back to the angels. She didn't come for the angels. She came for God. Qalat Rabbi. She said, Oh my Lord, how can I have a son when no one has touched me? And God talks back to her. Qala kadalika. Kadalika Allahu yakhluku ma yashau. This is how God does whatever God wishes. When God wishes something to be, he says to it, Kun fayakun. He says to it, Be, and it is. So there's two things I want us to pay attention to in these last few minutes. The angels come and deliver a news to Mary, but Mary doesn't talk to the angels in this story, in this narrative. Mary talks to God and with God. And that's indeed one of the common feature of the mystical tradition. They want that direct face-to-face unmediated, immediate encounter with God. And God talks with her. Qala, right? So in this case, it's not the angels that are talking to Mary. God is speaking with her. Well, what do we call someone who talks with God and God talks back to them? Many traditions would call them a prophet. So those perspectives that want to see Maryam as a prophet would be looking back upon this particular uh, feature. Rumi at one point comes back um, on the notion that Mary goes into a retreat and when people are asking her a question, uh, she chooses silence. She doesn't utilize words. She points to the baby Jesus. And Jesus, of course, speaks, and his own being is a kalima, a word from God. So the gospel, in that sense, the bushra um, that the angels declare to Mary, uh, the gospel is not a book about Jesus. Jesus himself in Islam, is the gospel, is the good news. And Rumi says that the word of Jesus and the silence of Mary go hand in hand. 
that a rich and robust spiritual life has to be one in which somehow we learn to balance together the luminosity of words with the receptiveness of silence. That silence is not simply the absence of words, but silence is an opening where we hear the words of God come just as a gushing stream came from under the feet of Mary. So I hope that um, this conversation here has been one that um, has nurtured you, has nourished you. Um, I hope you have found it um, inspiring. I hope it encourages us to go deeper and deeper, or to use a different metaphor, higher and higher uh, in our shared spiritual traditions. Um, I think it's in these kind of traditions that you see why it is that their statements attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the chosen one, in which he says, um, among all the prophets, no one has ever resembled me more than Jesus because there were no prophets sent between me and him. And, and there's this deep notion that the prophets resemble one another. Uh, this is a luminous family of the one light, the light of God, being refracted into the manyness of stories and genres and cultures and traditions. Um, I offer some more of these kinds of interpretations of the Quran uh, on a platform that I have called um, Illuminated Courses. Um, you would be welcome to check that out, and you might find other passages and other stories in the Quran interpreted in a similar way through um, the mystical tradition, through the poetic tradition, um, that I find is one of the most beautiful ways of going deeper and deeper inside our traditions. So friends, um, may each of us find that place in the East to withdraw to. When the pain comes, may it always be a pain, not for pain's own sake, but a pain that reminds us to be vulnerable like Mary, to be open to the voice that comes, to clutch on to that palm tree where if we only shake it, the fresh date of spiritual sustenance will fall. And though we thought we were in a barren desert, the springs that give life and give the water of life will gush from beneath your feet. So may that be our wish for not the Christmas of Santa, but indeed of the Christmas of Maryam and of Jesus of the Spirit. Amen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.